Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning. Um, welcome to the Siren Coffee and Science. Uh, my name is Nadia Islam, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Population Health at NYU. Um, we're really excited today to launch a set of six coffee and science conversations, really honing in on the assistance category described in the National Academy of Medicine report on integrating social care into healthcare. For those of you who haven't heard the first um, Copy and Science podcast featuring Kristen Bivens Domingo about that framework, when we say assistance, we're referring to healthcare sector activities that aim to reduce social risk by providing or linking patients with relevant social services. So I'm absolutely thrilled today to have the opportunity to talk with Maria Lemus, the executive director of Vision y Compromiso, an organization created and led by Promotoras that supports their work to improve well being and create lasting community change. So, Maria and I are going to talk today about community health workers or CHWs and promotoras assist people with social needs in healthcare and community settings. Um, and we're going to explore the kind of potential risks and benefits of formalizing CHW roles in the healthcare sector's social care workforce. Um, so, before we launch the conversation, I'm just going to pick, uh, share a few quick logistics. Uh, we welcome you to submit questions via the Q&A feature, and we've also activated the upvote and comment features on the Q&A and invite you to interact with other participants' questions. Um, I know in past sessions, there's been some really great discussions occurring between audience members, so we encourage that. Let's keep it going today. Um, and as a reminder, today's conversation is being recorded and will be released as a podcast in about a week. So let's get started. Are you ready, Maria? <laughs> yes, I'm ready. Thank you. Great. Um, so, you know, it's it's been a real, it's been great getting to know you um, through preparation for this podcast. And it's been a real privilege for me to have worked with and learned from CHWs over the past two decades. And I really consider this workforce a key pillar to achieving health equity. And Maria, I, I know that you know that following passage of the ACA and kind of movements towards value-based care, there's been this just mm -hmm. onslaught of interest. Um, by health systems partners in engaging CHWs, but you know this model is not new. Um, and so I'm particularly struck by sort of a lack of understanding from health systems in particular about what CHW, what the CHW model is and what the Promotoras model is. So I'm gonna turn to you. Can you tell us about the different models of CHWs and Promotoras both in healthcare and in the community and then kind of walk us through the core nature of their work really regardless of the setting. Well, thank you very much, Nadia. It, it really, I'm thrilled to be here. I think that um, there is a misunderstanding and, and it's interesting because Promotoras and the community model has been around, I say, since Eve was a grandmother. It's not new to any community. And the we say that the Promotora is the person that has the Espirito de Servicio. It's that person who, who initially from the heart wants to serve their community. That's really the core of who uh, the promotores and the modelists. Mm -hmm. And it exists across every country. You have the Felders in Russia, you have the Barefoot Doctors. Every racial and ethnic community has that aunt or the grandmother or that uncle who is. So what we did 20 years ago is we came together and we said, well, there's a lot of us who are doing this work informally. At that time, promotoras were mostly volunteers. And we wanted to really know more information so that we could share information. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, we we started to find that promotoras were not only, well, in those days, they were really not affiliated with health systems. They were in Girl Scouts, they were in resource centers, they're affiliated with church. They were in those natural conduct uh, places where we conduct uh, discussions. And as ACA came about and community health workers and promotoras were kind of uh, assigned a role then that role has evolved into what you see now, which is a lot of, a lot of um, iterations of the Promotor model. And those iterations happen because of funding. You know, the project development really requires a different language or a different, uh, a different activity, or it happens because of philosophy that um, you know, maybe the healthcare community wants, it, wants a Promotor, a community health worker to do something slightly different. Um, and so there's such a difference now. When, when we started, there was a clear uh, black and white, promotor, community health worker, and the community health workers are in counties. Now it's all gray, it's all in between. And it really is a function of so many uh, variables that 
I think what gets confused is who that person is. And it still really is this person here. Mm -hmm. um, APHA has defined it so, but the implementation of that and the development of that role and that position changes so dramatically. Oftentimes, it by the organizational wanting it to be image of who they are. Mm -hmm. And so it, cha it changes. Therefore, the requirements change, the training changes, the, the who that person is changes. Um, wow. and, and, and I think that's kind of a disservice to who that person is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I really appreciate, and I think from CHWs themselves and CHW leaders and activists, we hear this over and over. We really need to distinguish roles and responsibilities of CHWs exactly. and from their qualities. And I think that is, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's tricky, particularly for healthcare institutions to understand that CHWs and promotoras are really hired based on qualities and, and that central quality is around sort of a, a community helper nature, you know, like kind of like having a natural helping nature. Um, and then the other thing is to really, you know, reflect that this model is very much rooted in social justice and, and power building movements, um, you know, from across the country, from across the world, and it, particularly in the US as well, um, from the 1960s. So exactly. let's, yeah, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, you started to, to move towards this. What are some of the risks when healthcare institutions start institutionalizing CHWs and Dromothoras as a workforce? What, what have you seen as some of the pitfalls and challenges? Um, it, I think there are two that I can think right off hand. One is um, the workforce, who, who gets the jobs. And what we found early on is that um, because the design of that role was so, um, so narrow in scope and the organizations start to define it in their own image, meaning that, for instance, they want somebody who can write reports, who can do data, who can do it. Well, that's not a promotor typically. That's mm -hmm. usually, that could be somebody else, a, a, a specific different role. But as they start to bunch and think as an institution and intellectualizing what, that, what they want and the implementation of it changes the role of the person, which then changes who can apply for that position. And so we call it unintended consequences. If my mother was a promotora, for instance, and she had a sixth grade education, she had all the qualities that we're talking about. If you put a job description out that you want somebody who speaks fluent English, has a high school degree, um, can do data entry or understand computers, my mom would not, you would not get her, you would get me. And so the unintended consequence in workforce means that there is no direct line for a community promotor to move into employment. Um, we have a workforce initiative where we are working with promotoras to move them, give them some of those skills that they'll be able to apply for positions and also working with employers to kind of redefine what those roles are. What, what is your need and how can you best employ community? Because we believe that a job is the, the most important factor in a family's trajectory, employment, mm -hmm having money that you can spend on food, on transportation. And it, it affects it, you know, clearly affects the social determinant. So we have now started to really look at how to, uh, by example, we, we hire currently 150 promotoras across our projects. We've developed systems that support them. So by example, we're showing that you can take a farm worker, you can move her out of the fields, you can give her skills and abilities and whatever that project requires. You have a coordinator who's a promotora and then you have a manager who's a promotor. Mm -hmm. And we're showing by example that you don't have to bring in someone who has a, a BA or an MPH to supervise a group of promotoras. They can do it, but it requires some understanding and some skill building and some supervisory skills. Mm -hmm. I think that workforce is, is probably the big place that it's affecting uh, yeah. our community. Yeah, I, I really I, I really appreciate that you've centered workforce because I also, one thing that um, I think the CHW and Promotora model is fundamentally is a leadership building and capacity building um, opportunity as well as workforce. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think you sp speak to that really well in describing the kind of potential trajectory of taking, for example, a farm worker who has, you know, been very active in organizing, um, a, you know, right. labor populations and kind of moving them into the space of making connections between communities and healthcare system directly may address workplace challenges or issues. Um, and I think you were gonna mention one other sort of key, key challenge in, in terms I of- I think the other one for me is advocacy. 
And yeah. I think that adv we have always advocated in subtle ways. You know, the Latino community is really a very, especially our immigrant Latino community is very modest, I think. And most immigrant communities, I think internally are that way. And so how do we move our, our communities from understanding who they are in this new world and what their rights are and how do you advocate for their rights? I think that's really important for the second and third generations that we have. Mm -hmm. How can they model without losing uh, the essence of who they are? Without, uh, for instance, my mother, uh, my parents are Me were Mexican and they came here for a new life. They wanted better for their children, which we, I think we all have that in common, no matter where we're from or where our parents are from. And, uh, and they saw it happen with me, but for the sake of being American, quote American, and the melting pot, I lost a lot of what was very traditional in my early years because I had to merge into this, this system. But now we have this, the, an organization that provides that. So we honor the traditions that, that my children will learn about and my grandchildren hopefully will learn about. You know, the resiliency factors still are relevant to this day. And what, mm -hmm. when you think about, when I think about these, ch these children that are coming across or anybody who leaves their country from Nicaragua, which is 3000 or so miles away and comes here with the idea of, an, of a new life, um, what, what it takes to do that. You know, I can barely move from, from the Bay Area to LA without being traumatized <laughs> and, and they do that. So part of- what, never gonna move again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, you know, my son's in New York. I, I'm traumatized in these areas so far away. But how, how is it that we can help understand what the system is and how we can uh, survive, not only live in it, but survive and thrive in the system. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that advocacy and education is really important. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about those systems of support that are needed for CHWs and promotoras? I know your Visioni Compromiso has developed several reports on kind of best practices for mm -hmm. supporting the CHW workforce, for integrating CHWs into healthcare organizations. Um, and I think that there, you know, there's a kind of a growing literature and, and set of sort of implementation oriented best practices. So can you, can you give us some specific examples of that? And I, I think one of our viewers is interested in knowing, like, where should those systems of support be situated in the healthcare system or in the community or a combination of both? I think a combination, but certainly in the institutions, it's about leadership. You know, the leadership of that institution has to really be forward and say, I believe in this. And, mm -hmm. and then it goes down the chain, even to the receptionist. Um, if, if a promotora walks in the door or a client walks in the door and they're not greeted a certain way, mm -hmm. you've lost them. That's mm -hmm. kind of the, and, and so when you talk about um, uh, access and, and utilization, if you're not, you could maybe get them to open the door, but if you don't get them through the door, they're not gonna stay and they're not gonna adhere to those. So a lot of that I think is the promotor role. Um, imagine if we had a warm handoff to, and a promotor could greet you and could say something warm and welcoming, then I would feel better about going there and I would feel better about taking the next steps. So mm -hmm. I think it has to be both internal and external and the community um, needs to be informed, needs to be part of the process. We say that going to scale means partnering with community. Mm -hmm. There's just not enough doctors, nurses, et cetera, to take care of all of us. And in the community I work in with Latinos, we're a lot of people. And I'm overwhelmed by how many of us there are, and I'm one of them. And so how do we take care of ourselves um, with such limited resources? Because institutions only have so much money. Uh -huh. so, so for me, I, what I see is I see community in uh, organically taking care of itself. So I'll give you an example. Yesterday I was in Coachella and I was very excited about this because we're doing vaccination outreach and we're doing a lot of work there. And there's farm workers that are working right now in 99 degree heat, 99 degree heat. It's not even summer yet. And they're out there picking okra and you name it. So I went to one of, I was visiting the mobile homes, which are horrible for farm workers. This lady took me to her home and she has a garden of herbs that have, that take care of everything. Herbs for your knees, herbs for high blood pressure, herbs for this, herbs for that. And we should recognize so what exists already in our communities to support. So if I have diabetes, the doctor tells me, you know, you, you now have diabetes, and there's a warm handoff to somebody in the community who is well versed, who understands 
we have a nutrition program, we have an exercise program in the community that's free. Mm -hmm. And then this is a support, then that's the warm handout. That's going to scale because community is mm -hmm. already taking care of itself and formalize that relationship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, uh, I just want to go back to something you said a little bit earlier about kind of leadership buy-in at the healthcare level. You know, one thing that I, I think we've advocated for for CHWs and promotores is you know, there's a lot of talk about training and credentialing of the workforce, but I think the system also needs to be trained, right? So, oh. so leadership needs to be trained and other members of the healthcare team. And I think that's a little bit unique from, from other workforces. So can you tell us, can you reflect on that and, and tell us a little bit about how, how um, your organization has, has engaged in that? Well, if you look at our papers, our workforce papers, we identify six issues and one of them is supervision and leadership. Mm -hmm. There has to be a warm welcome. There has to be, so the organization has to embrace the model and has to embrace that person that's coming in. Otherwise, there is no connection. There's no integration of the promotor model. And the leadership has, to, so the, the CEO first has to make that proclamation. Then everybody has to understand the important role that that promotora play, plays. For instance, a promotora may be in the office only one day a week. Unless other employees know that that's their role is to be out in the community, then there could be a lot of things that happen, a lot of whispering and things, and, and they will feel uncomfortable. Also to be valued as, a, as an employee. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the difficulty is that institutions may have barriers of employment also. Um, I know that some hospitals require two and three and four levels of, of identification and of uh, screening, mm -hmm. and it may be difficult. So I, I do encourage or those organizations to partner with community-based organizations, which still meet requirements, but it may be a minimal requirement as opposed to, um, you know, three or four levels of screening. Mm -hmm. So there, are, and that's leadership. That's understanding that I need to work with agencies that can best access our community. Mm -hmm. And and I sometimes think that um, organizations want to keep it close to the heart. You know, they want to keep their property and they want it to be theirs. Right. When really it's everybody's and they should partner with existing groups that are already doing the work, support them in the work that they're doing and consider them as partners, not as employees, but as partners in the well-being of our community. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you mentioned earlier the sort of graying of, of differences between CHWs and promotoras and mm -hmm. um, I think patient navigator is another sort of role and term that's often um, conflated with those. So can you tell us about sort of um, based on your expertise and experience, what are the best roles for CHWs in, or promotoras in the healthcare system and is it different from a patient navigator role? Well, I believe that promotoras have a role from preconception to death. Mm -hmm. okay. that in the healthcare delivery system, we have a pregnancy prevention project and we're working with caregiving and, and Alzheimer's and hospice right now. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the continuum of care of an individual, having somebody help you is in every phase. And, and that's how we look at it. It's yeah. a social, yeah, it's a social ecological model that takes also the concerns of the family, not necessarily the concerns of a of a research study led by a DRPH who says, this is what is the need. Instead, we look at what are the needs of the families. Mm -hmm. um, the, and the navigator model is another model that's kind of uh, it, it erupted from the concept. So when I went back and I said that a lot of these, um, they, we go by many names and many projects. This is an example of you know another project that was developed, but at the core of it should be that person from yeah, the community agree. Who, who will drive who will drive it right and and i think i would argue that navigation is a task you know that that chws and promotors are certainly engaged in you know i think navigating complex systems and and making that um, relevant to the lived realities of, of the communities that they're serving is 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 a key part of what they do um, but it's it's sort of one task among many, and I think that really needs to be grounded in that sort of shared connection with them. I, I think COVID right now is a good example where where we started with COVID education. Now we're <clears throat> working with vaccine vaccinations, but a, 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 an activity that we're doing that came from that is navigation of resources. So how do I get online? How do I find those food resources? How do I 
somebody can give me a piece of paper and put it on the TV, go here for this resource. But if I don't know how to do it and I don't speak English and I can't wait on the line for 30 minutes or I don't have a phone that has, or I don't have internet broadband, that's Or I don't issue. have an email address, right? So many that's of my right. CWs have spent uh, an inordinate amount of time during the pandemic right. working with community members to establish an email address. Exactly, exactly. And so that's the intellectualization of our work. It's somebody who's thinking widgets as opposed to thinking people. And not, and that's where the, the that's where the, um, the separation comes with, and leadership means that leader, that CEO should understand and some, he should go talk to community or his staff and understand that those are the barriers. So when we're, we're non-compliant or we're, there's, you know, the hesitancy issue is not so much even that we're not compliant. Much of it is, I don't know how to get it. I don't know how to get online. I can't, don't, I can't wait for three hours on my turn in California. I can't, so there's so many complications to healthcare that we're not able to access and to take benefit of because of the systems that have been developed. Absolutely. And hesitancy is, is such a, uh, a reflection of kind of uh, structural racism and, and access issues, you know, and I, I think it's uh, I think that's uh, really important. Oh, not, now you get into something, <laughs> into a topic that it, it is, you know, when you think of the healthcare system that was developed mostly for a middle class community, and now we have such a diversity in the United States. How are we going to redesign it so that it's accessible for us, so that we can really take advantage of the services that that a system provides? The minute we walk, why should we walk in the door to do that? Why can't that system be with us? You know, when they designed when they designed whole person care, I was really excited because I thought that was going to be in the community. Uh -huh. We would have a little office and we'd be taking care of patients, or promotoras could be doing you know, high blood pressure readings or could be doing all those things in the community. Like we have our, our exercise in the community. Mm -hmm. And instead it became this within the circle. And so why not just break, break down those, those organizational barriers, mm -hmm. train promotoras, you know, look at what they're, look at what um, Raj Punjabi is doing in Liberia, what they're doing in Mexico, what they're doing in Central America. Promotoras across the world have been doing much more than they're allowed to do here in the United States mm -hmm. with training and with proper supervision. That pro, a promotor can do almost anything. And we have shown you know, through Vision and Compromiso, we manage about 45 projects right now. They can do it. Not everybody can do anything, but many of them can do everything. Mm -hmm. And they don't have a, a, they don't have an MPH and they don't have a VA, but they're really smart. And so I think it's changing our perception about who promotoras are, uh, who is this community, and what is it that they can do. Right. And I, and I think you spoke about the sociological model earlier. I think a unique piece of, of, of the CHW workforce is that they really are working across levels. You know, they're, they're working mm -hmm. on the interpersonal level, at the family level. Um, you know, having worked with CHWs, they are so, they're such gifted storytellers. And I think that that is a, such a critical piece of advocacy and policy, policy change that CHWs can really help to drive, so. Right, I mean, we, could, we can work in the fields, like I saw them in the fields um, in Coachella with, they, they, what they do, they went, some of them were taking the space and working the fields of a person they wanted to educate. So they could come out for 15 minutes and, and read some information or be told about something. Who's gonna do that as a, you know, who does that except a promotora because they know that they do whatever they need to to get the information out. Mm -hmm. So I think the misconception about who we are as a community, and I'm a promotora, who we are, what we do and the capacity to do, we can do almost anything if we're in an environment that's supportive and we're well-trained. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we don't have very much time left. This has been such an amazing conversation and 30 minutes goes so quickly. I do want to take one question that I feel very passionate about and I would love to hear your reflections. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, what needs to be done and, and what, what, what do we need to put in place to secure fair living wages for promotoras and CHWs and to really make the value to healthcare systems clear without medicalizing the role? Good question. <laughs> so uh, al along with this workforce um, effort that we're engaged in is, payment is, is a, a wage for promotoras. And um, I think that that wage can, right now, 
Okay, so right now CMS has, you know, the ability to Medi-Cal. There are some avenues in the federal government, but there, there are primarily restricted to um, medical organizations, either clinics or hospitals or those, or even mental health, um, mental health and behavioral health. But imagine if you could redefine and have authorized payment outside of the circle. So that's why the partnership with community is so important. So as a CBO, they can also use that, that, um, that you know, that uh, number that you use. Yeah, I can't think of what it's called. And, 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 and so of course, there's a billing, there, code. billing code. Thank you. you. We can use the billing code. Of course, we're trained you know, as a relationship. Imagine how many more promotoras would be able to work because now they have billing, they have uh, funding. And when we talk about sustainability of the model, it always comes down to funding because it's, it's soft money. But if there was some mechanism that will allow us to move it beyond uh, clinics and hospitals and those organizations to CBOs that are already doing the work um, and, and formalize that relationship, then, you would then you'd be able to hire more promotoras. And one thing about funding, uh, Biden, the Biden administration is really um, supportive of community health workers and promotoras. Yeah, 330 but 330 million towards the HLA. Yes. Mm -hmm. But but as as uh, as you're speaking about it, it would be important to note the distinction that that money should not only go to um, organizations um, like clinics, hospitals, and institutions, but also to CBOs who hire the majority or have uh, have them within their realm, the majority of promotoras, community health workers, and CHRs. And so I think it's an important distinction to make that um, the, 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 uh, the flow of money mm -hmm. should not just go in one direction, it should be spread out. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that's what uh, many district efforts we're trying to do. And, and I do want to underscore too, I know you know this from your, your work, that there have been successful models you know, of, of this type of contracting with, with CBOs and, and direct reimbursement. Um, I know from our work in New York City, Make the Road in New York City um, does a lot of work like that. There's many models in Oregon and California. So um, I want to just, I guess I just want to uh, give that hope to the audience and, and to, to health systems that are interested in kind of advocating for this model that um, it is possible. Uh, it is possible. And I think the intermediary, though, has been narrow in scope. And so expanding who that intermediary is to really um, include community as, as an intermediary, as opposed to being the recipient only. Mm -hmm. Then that's power. That's power building. It really right. recognizes the power of, of CBOs, of promotoras, to be part of their own destiny, mm -hmm. as well as kind of a, a workforce development strategy. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Well, we only have one minute left. It's, uh, I'm just blown <laughs> away by how quickly this went, and it was so wonderful speaking with you. I think that's all we have time for today. I want to express such deep gratitude to you, Maria, for, for all of your insights. Um, and thank you to all of our listeners for joining us today. Um, the next Coffee and Siren webinar is on April 23rd, and we'll feature Drs. Megan Sandel and Dr. Rhea Boyd, who will talk about challenging racist systems, processes, and analyses in social care. It's something that I think we started to touch on, and, and I think will be um, really uh, continued much further the next. So well, again, thank you. Thank you, Nadia. I'm really honored to be here. I appreciate the uh, the interest and all the work that you do in New York. And uh, I hope to visit fine. there. I hope my son's there. I hope to visit and I'll go by and we'll have coffee. Great. Have a great afternoon.